most of you know what HPRI is all about, but what we try to do is to convene researchers and policymakers to help and design and coordinate timely, relevant, and actionable research to end chronic homelessness in LA County. Our goals are, are fourfold, to foster collaboration and coordination among researchers who do investigate homelessness and its causes and consequences in the LA region. We want to translate research to policymakers and community partners who inform their practice, to conduct rapid response policy research to inform policy and program design, and to assist in developing and coordinating requests for proposals and research in homelessness relevant to Los Angeles. We have table tents around on each table to give you the HPRI website where we catalog some of this relevant research that we're putting together. We link to the research of the scholars who comprise HPRI and the work that they've done, so you can kind of review that as well. And we also encourage you to tweet your thoughts if you are you enjoy that kind of communication. Um, our Twitter handle is there, at HPRI underscore LA. Um, today is the second research symposium hosted by HPRI. Uh, these events provide an opportunity to go a little deeper in terms of the research that our, our uh, collaborative is working on here on the topic uh, of ending homelessness here in the region. Today we're very privileged to have Janie Roundtree, who's our Associate Director at HPRI, and Dr. Till Von Walker to discuss their new research within the city and county of Los Angeles to use advances in com computational technology and analytic te techniques to predict individuals that are at the highest risk of becoming homeless and to better target uh, target efforts to uh, prevent uh, homelessness. Janie and Till will give a presentation on the re relevant research findings, followed broad by a broad discussion on the policy implications of their work to date. I'm going to start that conversation with a few questions after their presentation, and then we'll open it up to the full room for discussion. So again, for those of you who don't know, both Janie and Till, let me briefly introduce them and their backgrounds. Janie Roundtree is the Executive Director of the California Policy Lab at UCLA, and as I mentioned, the Associate Director of the Homelessness Policy Research Institute. Prior to coming to CPL, Janie worked as the Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Rahm Emanuel in Chicago and focused on a variety of issues such as police reform, violence prevention, youth employment, and homelessness. She's also worked in Mayor Michael Bloomberg's administration, practice law, and even taught high school. Which of those was your, your biggest effort? I don't know, but, but you've uh, certainly done a lot. Um, Dr. Till Von Wachter is, is currently the faculty director of the California Policy Lab at UCLA and also holds many other positions, such as director of the Federal Statistical Research Data Center and also the associate dean for research in the social science division at UCLA. His research focuses on labor market conditions and how they affect the well-being of workers and families and has recently um, done a lot of work and research on homelessness here in the Los Angeles area using administrative data. With that, I'd like to welcome, I'm not sure who's going first, but welcome Till and or Janie to the podium. No. Till, come up to the podium and get us started. Thank you so much. And I'm just gonna say just a couple of words before opening the floor to Janie, who many of you know. Um, I'm a professor of economics, and um, the, the, the idea of the California Policy Lab is really to try a new way of doing uh, policy-engaged research, and the view is that we'd like to do rigorous academic research to really move the needle on the ground for programs and policies, and a key tenet of, of what we do is that this research is best done jointly with policymakers, right, uh, uh, to, to really move the needle on the ground. And, you know, if, if, if any of you have worked with academics, you know, they're pretty busy, they have certain focus, right? And so the idea of the California Policy Lab is really to have a core group of staff that can, you know, spend most of the time working what, on what matters for you, right? And also that speak your language and help uh, uh, communicating the results. And so we have uh, a wonderful group of staff here, Brian, Nafar, and Katie at the table in the back, who have worked really hard to make this happen today. And um, I'm just gonna wrap up by introducing Janie Roundtree, who co-leads the lab with me, and who Gary, gave the background, she has a background in local public policy uh, herself, and she has done a terrific job at leading a joint team of researchers from UCLA and the University of Chicago in this predictive analysis, and she's also fantastic at explaining it, uh, things that are pretty heavy lifting at times. I'm gonna open it to Janie, take it away. Thank you so much, Gary, for that introduction and for organizing this event, and to Ellie and Megan and others at HPRI who work really hard every day to pull off um, all the various activities. Um, 
I wanted to just start with this slide. As Till mentioned, I'm here, you know, it's my privilege actually to represent a quite a large joint research team. There are four principals at University of, uh, excuse me, at UCLA. There are four principals at University of Chicago, and there are about six additional analysts who have been working on the research that we're going to present today on pre predicting and preventing homelessness in Los Angeles. Um, so as Till said, if, if I can understand this topic, uh, hopefully you will too, um, considering I'm not a researcher myself. This is a, a technical presentation, and what I'm going to try to do at each stage is pause and sort of explain it in, in plain English, and also try to translate what we think might be the implications of the work that we're doing. But I would really encourage you to raise your hand at any point if what I'm saying isn't clear. I'm quite used to that. I'm happy to pause um, on any particular topic and, and go into more detail, so just raise your hand. That's totally fine with me. Um, I also wanted to just say briefly that this work as of this week is supported in part by the Max Factor Family Foundation in collaboration with the Jewish Community Foundation of Los Angeles, and we're really appreciative of their support of, of the work. Um, and finally, the last note I wanted to say before beginning is that unlike the presentation, if you attended last year, that Suzanne Wenzel gave, we are really presenting results midstream. Um, th these are not final results, and uh, that's why the title slide says draft. Um, <laughs> we are still acquiring data. We are still refining the analysis. A lot of what you're going to see here um, will be subject mostly to refinement. We don't expect it to change dramatically. Um, and it's really uh, very enjoyable for us to present midstream and to not wait until we're finished, because we found that every time we talk to a group like this, we learn so much from the people in the room and the questions that they ask. Um, and so we're really eager to hear your feedback um, and how you think this work might be useful. Um, so just briefly, I'm going to talk for two minutes about the California Policy Lab. Till already did that. Then I'm going to dive right into what the goals of this project are, where we're trying to predict homelessness in Los Angeles. We're going to have to do a little bit of, of work around the data sources that we're using and the methodology. And I just really the key points that we think are important to interpret the results. Then we're going to go into the modeling results. And really what modeling results here are just we're trying to answer the question, how accurately can we predict homelessness in Los Angeles? Um, and then once we go through the answer to that question, we're going to take a step back and look at who is at risk of homelessness, who's currently being served by LA County agencies. And then finally, we're going to start to talk about what we think are the risk factors for homelessness. Um, and I think I see at least one or two people who've seen a version of this presentation in January when we presented it to the people we're working in close collaboration with. I just wanted to reassure you, this version is shorter. <laughs> and there is also new information in here. So um, hopefully, you'll find it enjoyable. So I'm going to skip this since Till covered this um, about what the California Policy Lab does. We work with government agencies on applied research. Um, one thing that you may not be aware of is that we work across five interrelated research areas. You all might not know our work on homelessness in Los Angeles the best, but we also work on criminal justice, labor, poverty, social safety net, and education. And when we launched the lab two years ago, we picked these very intentionally because it's very hard to understand any of these issues in isolation. Obviously, if you are focused on the homeless population, you also need to know what, how it intersects with the labor market, with workforce development, with training, um, and with poverty and, and benefits. So we have uh, about 24 uh, clients right now of the lab. Six of them are large state agencies, and the rest um, are clients or county clients, either in Los Angeles or primarily in the Bay Area. We have two sites, one at UCLA and one at UC Berkeley. Um, just briefly, we are doing a lot of work on homelessness here in Los Angeles. And this is just a sample of the projects that we've been working on over the last two years. The largest is the one that we're going to present on today. There's actually a second work stream on predictive analytics where we're predicting high cost utilization among the homeless population. And we're not going to talk about that today. Um, we've also been evaluating a family homelessness prevention pilot um, in Van Nuys. Uh, that is supported by um, Molly and her staff. Um, we uh, provided the statistical analysis for the Ad Hoc Committee on Black People Experiencing Homelessness last year and continuing into this year. Uh, we're working on understanding employment histories of people who are homeless. We've actually been able to link LA County's Homeless Management Information System data, or the HMIS, to California wage records so that we can look at whether people are working immediately prior to, during, or after their homeless spell in, in Los Angeles. Um, and finally, just last week, we presented analysis on um, 
uh, of a national data set comparing the unsheltered homeless population to the sheltered homeless population, and we would be happy to make that available if people are interested in that. So um, we've been working on this problem of predicting homelessness in Los Angeles for about two years now, um, and about half of that time, if not more, was just on the sole phase of collecting data, cleaning it, and linking it across agencies. It was a, a huge amount of work, which is why the research team is so large. A lot of that is just basic computational uh, effort. Um, and we're about midstream, as I mentioned. Later this year, we're expecting to produce results on our prediction of high cost utilization. So the big question that motivates this work is, can we prevent homelessness? Um, that's the whole point of this. We're not doing a data science project just to see if we can make a cool computer science program. We really want to see if we can start to reduce the inflows of homelessness into Los Angeles. I found that when people talk about prevention, they can mean different things. Um, and I want to acknowledge that I took this typology of prevention from Mary Beth Shin's t recent talk that she gave on the Apt Associates webinar, if any of you attended that. But I, I find it really uh, a useful way of thinking about prevention. Some people talk about universal prevention, which is addressing the social conditions that produce homelessness. So these are sort of the broad societal infrastructure that might drive people into poverty and homelessness. When we talk about prevention, we're really talking about targeted prevention. And these are programs that are designed to address people who are at very high risk of becoming homeless. And when you think about targeted prevention and what you're trying to do, it should be effective. So the program should be designed to create housing stability for these people who are at high risk. It should be efficient, meaning it should be given to the people who are at highest risk of becoming homeless. Um, and then when you evaluate whether it's effective or not, you should be able to observe at the community level that you're reducing inflows into homelessness. So you're not just pushing the problem down farther. The second point around making it efficient or targeting is perhaps the biggest challenge um, for anyone who is trying to design prevention. Um, and to go back to our big research question, can we prevent homelessness, it really requires answering at least two sub-questions, one of which is, who is actually at highest risk of homelessness? The second question being, what prevents homelessness and for whom? So a lot of the talk today is going to be about this first sub-question. How do we figure out who is at highest risk for homelessness in LA? So I want to put that in perspective for a second. Um, I think to all of you in the room who are working on homelessness, the problem feels massive, um, especially if you're working in Southern California. There are, in fiscal year 2017, LA County served about 2.2 million clients who are living in poverty. In that year, um, using our definition of homelessness, which I'll talk about in a minute, we saw 150,000 clients who were homeless and 55 clients who were homeless, 55,000 clients who were homeless for the very first time in that year, right? So um, this is uh, the point that I'm trying to make here is that homelessness, while it feels huge, and it is a crisis, is actually statistically very rare among people living in poverty in Los Angeles. So to, to put it a different way, if you have 100 people in a room, you've got to try to figure out which of the two of those 100 people will fall into homelessness. Um, that makes it very hard to target these scarce resources and figure out who should get cash assistance or who is at highest uh, risk for case management or other things that we might consider as prevention. So our hypothesis in thinking about this targeting problem is that predictive analytics or machine learning, or sometimes people call it artificial intelligence, can actually be really useful in trying to solve this problem. Um, let me take a step back and say that if you were to have a casual conversation with people in your life, professionally or otherwise, about what you think the risk factors are for homelessness, my hunch is that you would hear things like poverty, the lack of housing, um, the intersection between income and the housing market. Some people might focus on the intersection of criminal justice involvement um, and labor market attachment or how difficult it is to find jobs if you have a criminal record. Other people might be more focused on mental illness um, or trimorbidity, the presence of mental illness with substance abuse and physical health concerns. The point I'm trying to make is that the human brain um, has a hard time computing all of these things at once or understanding how each of them might interact with each other and create risk factors for people. Um, and we have a lot of sort of 
learned knowledge or experienced knowledge in some cases, but we don't have a lot of really rigorous evidence about how all of these things are interacting. So what predictive analytics is doing is taking large administrative data sets from agencies like the Department of Health Services or the county hospital system, Department of Mental Health, the substance abuse treatment, uh, the jail, probation, uh, Department of Social Services, which is the social safety net benefits uptake. And it's looking at a huge variety of different features that might uh, affect a particular client. And then it's looking at the interactions of those features. So while we might loosely talk about mental health or criminal justice involvement, what um, artificial intelligence can do or machine learning can do is look at millions of these things at once. Um, and they're looking at the time period, you know, how many days since the person was in the jail, was the person in the jail, why they were also seeking mental health treatment, and on and on and on. So when we thought about what would be most useful to predict for purposes of designing prevention programs, we decided to predict two different outcomes. One is any new homeless spell, and the other is a first-time homeless spell. And the first time homeless spell is a subset of any new homeless spell. So I'm just going to pause here for a second. If you think about what might be useful for prevention, you're not just trying to prevent new homeless people from coming in for the first time. You're also trying to prevent people from returning to the system. So how do we, if we've served someone who's been homeless in the past, how do we prevent them from coming back in and seeking services again? So the new homeless spell, the way we defined it, is that the person could not have been homeless for at least six months prior to the outcome period. So we needed to observe a minimum of a six-month break in their homeless spell. So what this is really doing is taking out the chronic homeless population. Um, and we know from typologies that there is a subset of the homeless population who are chronically homeless. First-time homelessness is actually a subset of that new homeless spell and is even more rare. And these are people that we have, from the data that we have, we cannot observe them being homeless at all prior to the outcome period. So this is just a visual demonstration of the size of these groups. The larger blue circle is actually any homeless spell. So this would include people who are chronically homeless. The smaller yellow circle are new homeless spells. And then the, sm the smallest light blue circle are people who are homeless for the first time. So key facts to understand. The first one we'll be talking about which data <laughs> sets we're using. Thank you for the prompt. Um, so we are looking at, to, to build the model, we are looking at five years of service history data from fiscal year 2012 through 2016, and we use that data to train the model and predict outcomes in 2017. Um, if you're familiar with these types of data science projects, the first thing that you do is build the model to train on a year where you know the outcome. And that's really important because that's how we determine whether it's accurate or not. So we needed to point the model at a year where we could go back and observe how many people actually were homeless in that year. Um, there's actually an important feature here, which is that the outcome period that we defined um, in collaboration with the county was a full year. So that's, this is important because if you are homeless at the end of the year, any interaction you have with an agency, for example, in the six months prior, will not be included in risk factors because they are in the outcome period. Um, I'm going to come back and talk more about that in a second because um, that might be slightly confusing, and you'll see why it matters in a, about five more slides. Um, the second thing that, that's important is how we're defining homelessness for data science. You have to pick a definition that you can observe in the data. In this case, we are using the HMIS, which you're all familiar with. We're also using what's called the general relief homeless flag. So this is data that we acquire from DPSS and people who are enrolled in the general relief program. When they switch their address from their home address to the district office, the DPSS considers them homeless. There's a lot of questions around the accuracy of this. If you're familiar with the HUD definition of homeless, this isn't technically homeless. Um, we've tested sort of the accuracy of this. And interestingly, we see these flags being turned off and on. Um, there was a theory that people are turning them on for the purpose of getting additional benefits and then leaving them on for long periods of time. And that has largely not been the case um, in our observation. And the average homeless spell in the general relief population is about six months, which is pretty consistent with what you would see in the HMIS. I'm not saying that it is, in fact, totally accurate. And I think one of the next things that we'll do is really dig into what is going on with the GR homeless population. The third thing you need to know is that this is a, a model predicting homelessness among single adults. 
Um, finally, the, the other thing to know is that you can't um, include people in this modeling exercise unless they have a prior service history with the county. That's sort of an, an obvious point, but the model needs data to work with in order to predict your individual risk. And if someone is appearing for the first time seeking county services the moment they are homeless, they won't be in the model. Um, and I'm going to show you some visualization of why that might matter. So Molly just asked a follow-up question around this GR population. This is the actually overlap between the GR homeless population and the HMIS, and it's only about 10%. Um, so we decided to include either or in our definition. Um, just interesting, we don't have this slide here today, but other agencies do have homeless flags, and I think this is an important area, I think, for the county and others to think about how to incorporate them in this, time of, this type of analysis. So the Department of Health Services has its own homeless flag. It doesn't go back far enough for us to include it in the model. Um, that has about 20% overlap with the HMIS, and I think that will continue to grow as the Housing for Health program gets more integrated into the coordinated entry system. But we, there are these other administrative flags. There's a new one at the jail, um, I think a newer one at the Department of Mental Health. And improving the quality of that data collection will be hugely important for understanding where the county is interacting with homeless individuals outside of uh, the data that LASA is collecting. So I mentioned this issue of prior service history. Um, one of the things that we found really striking is how few people experiencing homeless for the first time had a prior service history with the county. So that's the, the, part, the pie chart on the far right. Um, and it's about 37%. There's a big caveat here, which is that we are still pulling in data from um, CalFresh, CalWorks, um, and DCFS, so this percentage is likely to go up when we have the service histories, particularly from those agencies where we think there are lots of people at high risk for homelessness. Um, to me, what's, what's, there are two things interesting about this. One, you should know that when we present modeling results, we're not able to include those people in the yellow part of the pie chart because we have no way to observe them. But this, to me, is also important for thinking about what you are doing for clients who are appearing uh, as homeless for the first time, and we think that Things like benefits counseling or attaching them to county services could actually be a really important intervention if the vast majority of them are not already seeking services. The other two pie charts are just uh, for the entire homeless population and then the new homeless population. And the yellow there, by the way, is just attributed to the first time homeless population and those other two. So just to be a little bit uh, more specific about our data sources, I already mentioned this, but we're working with the Enterprise Linkage Project data, if you're familiar with that. That includes DHS, DMH, DPH, and the Substance Abuse Treatment, Department of Social Services, Probation, Sheriff, and then uh, we were able to link in the HMIS system. We were using data from 2012 to 2016, um, and then we were testing modeling results using fiscal year 2017. The next section of the presentation, we're actually going to show you what the modeling results look like. So how accurately can we predict these two outcomes? Um, there's lots of different ways to assess model performance when you're doing a project like this. And what we're going to show you today is a, just a pretty simple comparison in fiscal year 2017 of how our predicted outcome compared to the actual outcomes. OK, so let me just talk about how we're going to um, show how accurately you predict homelessness. Basically, what the model is doing is it's looking at these features. Um, we have about, I think, nine, 900 plus that are feeding into these models. And then it generates what, what we call a risk list, and it rank orders the people on the list. I should say, by the way, that we don't actually know who these people are. All of the data is completely de-identified. But it takes unique client identifiers, and it ranks them like 1 through 100,000 in terms of highest risk. And then we cut the list at various sizes, and we look at um, two things. One is how many people on the list that we generated were actually homeless. That's answering the question of how precise the list is or the precision of the model. The second question we ask is, if you took that size list, given the precision, how much of the problem are you solving? So how many of the homeless people did you capture with the list? And that's what we call recall. So we're going to go through precision and recall for the next uh, couple of slides for the, um, for the list that we generated. Um, I should also say that there's an obvious trade-off here. So we didn't presume to know what size list the county would prefer. So if you take a list of 3,000 people, the top 3,000 people, you can anticipate that you'd have higher precision, so more people on the list would be homeless, but you're going to capture a much smaller part of the overall problem. 
Um, if you generate a list of 100,000 people, you're going to have a lot more recall. You're going to cover a lot more of the problem, but the overall list will be less precise. Another way of thinking about this is that if we just created a list of 2 million people, we would have perfect accuracy because we would capture everyone, but the list itself would be very, it would be very imprecise because you'd have no idea who on the 2 million person list um, is actually homeless. And that's a really, I think, an important concept to know if you're a consumer of data science and other contexts and people present modeling results to you, um, you really want to ask some of these questions around how they're uh, presenting their results to you. So we're going to first talk about uh, how well we did at predicting new homeless spells. So these are people who are returning to homeless and or presenting themselves as homeless for the first time. When we created that 3,000 person list, about a third of the people on the list were going to experience a new homeless spell. Um, and if you served everyone on that list, you'd capture about 2% of the overall problem in that year. Um, and you can see just a, a graphic on the right hand side uh, of the green, the green line. The yellow line, by the way, we're not going to go through those results, but that's what it looks like if we're trying to predict any homeless spell. So that includes the chronic population. It turns out that we're actually very good at that, but it doesn't really help us with designing prevention. But we can get to about 86 87% accuracy if we're just predicting homelessness overall. Um, new homelessness is much more rare, so we're, we're getting a precision of about 32%. If you cut the list at 21,000 clients, then you're, the precision goes down to 23%, but you start to capture a quarter of the problem for that fiscal year. There's a really important um, note here on this slide. This might be hard to read, but um, the last column on the table says, of everyone on the list, including the people who were not actually homeless, which is what we call a false positive, so these are people the model is predicting will become homeless who didn't actually become homeless, if you look at the entire list, everyone on that list is 14 times at higher risk of homelessness than your average county client. So this is a very vulnerable, high-risk group of people. Um, and that's important to sort of think about how you allocate resources. So you can't expect a model that's predicting something so rare to have perfect accuracy. So then you start to ask, what would happen if I served a group of people including the false positives? And you're getting a very high-risk population. So as you might expect, predicting first-time homelessness is even harder because it's a subset of the prior group. And here you have, at the top 3,000 list, a precision of 14.3%. And you have, you're capturing about 2% of the problem. And again, the whole list is about 14 times um, more likely to experience a first-time homeless spell than your average ELP client. These results, by the way, are consistent with what we see nationally in this area. We're only aware of one other county working on this, Allegheny County in Pennsylvania. Their modeling results are, are slightly less precise than these, but this it was sort of reassuring to know we were in the rough ballpark of using administrative data to predict homelessness. So I mentioned that um, these people on, this, on these risk lists, even if not 100% of them become homeless, appear to be vulnerable. Um, and we see that when we calculate their risk of becoming homeless, but we also see that when we look at their utilization of other county services, right? So, the people on these risk lists are 12 times more likely to be a DPH client, which is the substance abuse treatment data. They are nine times more likely to be in the jail. They are um, 13 and a half times more likely to be seeking a GR benefit. They're four times more likely to be seeking mental health services, six times more likely to be on probation. So maybe one of the most important insights we got from this phase of the work is that Falling into homelessness happens very, very quickly. And this is a visual demonstration of how service utilization jumps in the six months prior to a homeless spell. So I mentioned a few minutes ago that I would come back to this issue of how we define the outcome period. So we were looking at five years of data to predict homelessness within an entire calendar year. And what we realized is that when you have an outcome window that's so long, you're actually missing a lot of this activity that is hugely risky that's happening right before the homeless spell. So we re-ran the models if we could have a six-month outcome period, and it improved the results by 70 to 80% for both of the models. We can't actually do a six-month outcome period with the way the county um, data infrastructure works now and the way that data is fed into the integrated data system, but we're hopeful that that could be possible actually later this year with the ELP modernization where we're going to go to a live, updated, integrated data system. Um, and we think that could be really helpful. 
I think for the time being, the thing to know from a policy perspective is that this is happening very quickly and we have to be able to react. We've got to have a system that's nimble enough to catch people um, in that six month window. So what are the practical implications of the modeling results? So first of all, if we served the top 1% of the risk list for a new homeless spell, we could have prevented 6,000 homeless spells um, in that year. Uh, we've already mentioned this, but the entire risk list are 14 times more likely to be homeless than your average uh, client who's being served by the county. Uh, we know that these people are very vulnerable and they're interacting with other systems at much higher rates than your average client. Um, and we know that falling into homelessness happens very quickly and we really need to focus on this six month lead up into the homeless bill. So now we're gonna talk briefly about what we know so far about the people who are on these lists. Um, and this is the work that we're doing to think about implementation. So what would we do with this, this model um, or what, what would the county more importantly do with it? and what do we know about these people? And then we're gonna um, talk about what we think are potential risk factors. Um, so just to go back to our large motivating research question, can we prevent homelessness? I said there are these two sub-questions. Now we're on sub-question two, which is what interventions would, we, would prevent homelessness and for whom? And we can't really answer such a big and important question, but what we're gonna do is start to answer who's at risk. For example, how old are they? What's the gender of the people on the list? Um, what are their recent service histories? Um, what percentage of each agency's clients are at risk for homelessness, which is a slightly different way of thinking about it from an implementation point of view. And then finally, what are we learning um, uh, right now about what the risk factors are? So on, on the demographics, this is not surprising at all, but single adults on the risk list are about 70% male uh, compared to 54% average. That's pretty consistent if you're familiar with homelessness demographics. One interesting thing is that the homeless, the first time homeless population on the risk list are a lot younger, actually on average five years, which is quite a lot, um, than the general population, the homeless population, or, or other risk lists. So this is telling us that these first time homeless people are potentially younger, they're maybe more likely to be working, um, they might actually need a lighter touch intervention if we can isolate who they are. That's a lot of hypotheses. <laughs> we don't know any of that, I should say, but it's something I think to pay attention to. Um, this is looking at service utilization of people who are at risk. So in the prior five years, 78% um, were on the GR. I think that's to be expected because the GR is built into the model. Maybe slightly more interesting is the fact that 64% of them had at least one jail stay within the prior five years. 58% were DMH clients, 56% were DHS clients. And more than half of them had contact with at least three or more different county agencies. Um, if we look at just the year in which the prediction was made, we see 64% on GR and 28% in the jail. So let me put this in, in a different way. If we were to do this prediction now for the future, and we were to generate the list of people we think at risk, we would find about 30% of them in the jail. So then I said we were gonna look at um, what percentage of each agency's clients are at risk for homelessness. The agency with the largest percentage is actually DPH with the substance abuse data. That's actually probably a function of the fact that they're only serving about 17,000 clients. Um, however, of those people, um, I think it's 37% uh, of DPH clients will experience homelessness. 22% of people on probation, 20% of people um, who are coming into contact with the sheriff or the jail, 12% of DMH clients and 5% of DHS. The DMH percentage and the DHS percentage sound small, but you have to keep in mind that they're serving vastly more clients than an agency like DPH is serving in substance abuse treatment. So the, the previous slides are really what we would call um, just basic descriptive statistics of people on the list. That doesn't mean they're risk factors. So I wouldn't go so far as to say that being in the jail is a risk factor for homelessness. That, that might actually be the case, but we wouldn't want to take that conclusion from what we just showed you. So now we're going to talk about what we think are the real risk factors. And this is the work that we are really in the middle of doing right now. Like as of yesterday, some of this information is, is brand new. So the way that we approach this um, so far, we've been talking about how we generated the models, how accurate they are what kind of data is feeding into them and who's at risk. So if you think about 
the fact that in the, the models that we presented, which was using a random forest, we have over 900 different features. That's not really helpful in understanding how to make decisions, right? That's a lot of information. I mean, one way to implement that is just to let the model produce the list and hand the list over to agencies to go find people at risk. But that's sort of a black box. You don't really know what's important um, about the people on the list. So what we're trying to do in this phase of the work is start to cut that long list of, of risk factors into the smallest number possible without losing model accuracy. And what we found so far is that the absolute minimum number is 50. You see a huge drop off in model accuracy if you go below 50. And optimal performance is probably closer to something like 100 to 250 different risk factors. Um, and so we're right now that that sort of I didn't I didn't know that going into this that it would be that long, but it sort of makes sense given the fact that we're predicting an outcome that's so highly dimensional around people's lives and their interactions and their experiences. So what we're trying to do now is cut those. Um, just take a look at which of the risk factors are are appearing most frequently in the model. So as the computer does it work. It's picking out certain risk factors much more frequently than others. And then we're trying to reverse engineer and look at what might actually be driving the risk here. So um, there's a lot more work to be done, but we're seeing a couple of, I think, um, interesting trends. And I'd be really curious to hear your reactions to this or how you might interpret them. Um, Obviously, prior receipt of general relief is important. As I said, that's built into the model. So that's um, maybe uh, an exception to thinking about the importance of this. We do see Department of Health Services, mental health, sheriff, and probation consistently in the top 20 features um, selected by the model. Maybe more interesting, it seems to be very important when one client seeks multiple types of services from one agency. Um, and so we don't know why that is, but that uh, for lots of different kinds of agencies, we're seeing that as a, an important sort of top 20 feature. Um, the last thing that the model is selecting frequently is temporality or the measurement of time between the last service. It's not always the case that actually more recent is more predictive. There are some agencies where uh, farther out is more predictive. Um, but these are things like how many days since the last jail stay, how many days since the last DMH visit. Those seem to be things to pay attention to. Um, and then finally, we're noticing some geographic or spatial patterns that are important, and specifically clients who are visiting multiple locations of the same agency. So one hypothesis is that people at risk of homelessness are more mobile, and they're not in place in one time. And so they're seeking um, potential services from a lot of different places from one agency. We don't really know the explanation of that, but it was an interesting feature that sort of jumped out as being predictive of, of future homelessness. Um, and then the last thing is that uh, the last zip code and the SPA code also seem to be predictive. And I know the first question I'm going to get is, which zip codes and which SPAs? <laughs> um, and I actually don't know yet, because we were talking about this result uh, at like at 5 PM yesterday. So this is like, really? This is like the hot donut that comes off the conveyor belt. Um, but. Uh, so we can't answer that. And I'm, I'm really uh, averse to putting information out there that, that might change. But that seems so geographic location does seem to be really important. So uh, just to wrap up, we are constantly thinking about you know, what does this all mean and what do we do with it? I think you know, there are some things that, that we think are obvious. And I'd love for you to add to this list. But um, one is that we could use this information to proactively go out and find people who are at risk for homelessness who are not going to self-identify to the system and who are not attached to the system. This could actually be important for actually reducing overall inflows if we can find how to get to the people who are at high risk who are not um, already attached. I think once we have a better understanding of what these risk factors are, I think they could be very helpful in designing the actual prevention program. So the homeless population is highly heterogeneous. The people have very different experiences coming in. And it's always been my feeling that we need to design programs potentially that are more specifically targeted at a population experiencing a certain risk fact, set of risk factors. And I think really putting some information around that will help people think about how to do that. Um, I think another, another thing that we could do is just to have better insight into what agencies that are not in the homeless services system can do for people. So it has not been the mandate of the health system to prevent homelessness. But I think the health system could be open to doing that if we can find a way of articulating 
who of their current clients are really at high risk and what they need. And so the idea is to start shifting the burden um, or, or sharing the burden of preventing homelessness, not just within the homeless services system that's funded by Measure H, but also to think about what else is available to serve uh, clients who are at risk. You know, obviously we think this could help target scarce resources. So if you go back to that problem, if you have 100 people in a room, which two of them are going to become homeless and who gets the cash assistance, you know, we think this could be really helpful in, in trying to solve that problem partially. It's not a perfect solution. Um, and then finally, one interesting thing about this data set, um, now that we've been able to link it and build it, is that we can start to detect the outcomes in the health and mental health and criminal justice system for housing interventions. So we're often really focused on, does this housing intervention create housing stability for a person? But now we can also look at, is it making them healthier? Is it reducing their mental health service utilization? Is it reducing their returns to the jail system? Um, and that's important you know, to understand the work that we're doing and its impact on people. It's also really important for generating evidence that brings those systems to the table to help solve the homelessness crisis. So um, just on behalf of the research team, we have at least uh, these five major work streams that are continuing and, and many, many more that will crop up. But one big priority is to understand the GR population a little bit better. And we're connecting to staff at DPSS to really go on the ground and figure out um, who these clients are. Um, we're working to add additional data sets, as I mentioned earlier, particularly CalFresh, CalWorks, and DPS, DCFS data. We're in the middle of refining our understanding of these risk factors. Um, we're going to see with the ELP modernization whether we can explore this six-month outcome period, which we think will improve the accuracy of the models that we're using. And then we're working actively with LASA and DHS and others in the system to start thinking about how you would implement this and whether there are certain types of prevention that you could design around what we're learning from the models. That's it. Thank you. So how many of you have walked through a random forest in the past? I hope, I hope many of you have. How many of you walked through the random forest before today? Well, we have at least some people should be raising your hands. You did the work through the random forest. Yes, yes. Um, one of the, there's, there's many questions. And I think what's, what's kind of is really interesting about this as data science to look at these questions is that a lot of the people in the room have run a, what I would call a parametric model to predict homelessness. They have had on the uh, left-hand side of their regression model a 0-1 tag, which is homeless or not. And then on the right-hand side, they've had a variety of, of explanatory variables to predict that. And that has a certain kind of uh, parametric properties attached to it. Um, this site sort of technology, this sort of methodology, is perhaps very different for a lot of people in the room. And I, I wondered if you could comment based on the team's work um, a little bit about how these trade-offs with a non-parametric approach like this versus the parametric approach would, you know, kind of how, how do we interpret that? Do you end up with different results? Do you end up with more efficient results? What are the kinds of things that really come out of this that you wouldn't find if you were running a linear probability model or logit or probit model or something like that? I, I should take that. Well, I think the, the important message here is that the, the key here is, of course, that you want to have a good prediction that is independent of the particular statistical approach you're taking, right? Because you're taking a bunch of information that has, you know, substantive information on the risk of homelessness, and you try to combine it to the event of homelessness in the best possible way, right? And there are a whole range of, you know, techniques out there called data science right, that you know, are evolving day by day. And it would be silly, or we wouldn't want to take you know, a tool to, on the ground that differ depending on the particular model that we use. So we actually spend quite a bit of time, to, for example, to compare this, you know, heavy lifting approach that, that's called random forest and compared it to a standard, you know, logit model, right? And the difficulty is, if you want to talk about techniques, is that if you have many, 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 many predictors, you know, it, it, the question is how do you pair those predictors down? And that's to some degree is where the rubber meets the road. And the good news is, they, that this model right, has very similar predictive accuracy to a simpler model where you do the work of you know, par, you know, 
thinking hard to pare down the right number of variables. And just to add, you know, not only want to, do we want to make sure that the results, the predictive results are robust, we also care about the predictive factors down the line, and we also want those to be robust. Right? We don't want two different statistical techniques to give different weight on different predictive factors, because we think there's sort of an underlying reality that these models are supposed to capture. Right? And that's what we're working on. Yeah, I would just add to that that um, ideally we would we would use all of these various techniques to understand the results and then select a model or a technique that has the highest level of transparency to the users, right? So what we presented is really the black box. You don't really know what's going on, whereas a parametric model or a logit or a probit might be more transparent as to what the factors are. So I know that, that a lot of people have questions around that when we get to the implementation. I just don't think we're quite there yet to understand what that would look like. Uh, Chris Coe, United Way. Um, I'm curious, in terms of the homeless flag from GR, if, is your algorithm any more or less predictive if, um, if you based it just on HMIS as the final kind of stamp of whether they're homeless or not and didn't use the GR homeless flag? Yeah, that's a great question. We actually just created that model in the last few weeks to see. And Brian, you probably remember off the top of your head, but I think the precision goes down to about 10%. Yeah, yeah, because the HMIS data is a smaller definition of the outcome, so then it becomes more rare and thus harder to predict. And so the precision will go down. I think an open. For the, from the 30 to the 10 or from like the. Brian, do you remember? Yeah, I can I just, so the. You know, the first time homelessness models, first time homelessness is a much rarer event. And the HMIS outcomes we looked at also are much rarer events. So remember that lowest yellow line, that's what we get for the, for the HMIS. In the sense, you can think of the GR pool capturing a broader pool of homeless. A subset of those is showing up at a shelter. And that's going to be just much rarer. Right? Brian, does that accurately describe it? Yeah, that's, that's right. So if you recall, there was a. Uh, if you recall, there was a Venn diagram where you saw, you know, the GR homeless population and then the HMIS homeless population, and then there was like a 10% overlap. So once you get rid of the GR, um, the prevalence of uh, new homeless spell goes down from, uh, I think, 2.5% to about 0.8%, and first-time homelessness goes down from 1% to about 0.5%. Um, and uh, correspondingly, you know, precision, precision goes down, although if you evaluate it in terms of you know, this, this concept of, well, how much more likely uh, are those individuals on that list to, to experience these outcomes, um, that measure is actually quite, quite similar. Um, but uh, it's, it's really the, the lower prevalence that's driving it. Yeah, to me, this is really a policy question. So is it more useful to have a slightly less precise tool that's pointed at HMIS utilization, which is capturing services funded by a particular set of funding streams, right? And that, that might actually be preferable, but we're just trying to present options, really. So Molly Rice from the Supervisor at QL Office. First off, thank you. Hats off to all the researchers. This is really amazing data, and there's tons of information in here we've never seen before, which is really exciting. Um, one of the things I'd love to see, and I don't know if it's possible, um, obviously, we've done a lot of work around the jail system at the same time that we're working on the homeless system. Um, but one of the things we find is it's much easier to connect people in the jail to services the longer they're in jail. So it'd be really interesting on that jail population for 64% of these folks to have had a prior jail stay. Is a, it's a big number. Um, and we're really sort of ramping up what we're doing to connect people to services. But it'd be really interesting to understand, are they there for misdemeanors versus felonies? Are they there pre-trial? Are they there for very short periods of time? Like we know for women, their average stay is six days in the jail. And it's very difficult to move fast enough for somebody who's only in the jail six days to get them to services. So getting more information about jail stays um, would be super helpful in terms of thinking about how to target interventions, because that's a huge policy priority for the county. I think that's that's so interesting, and and 
We're not actually sure that the jail is the most important risk factor, but for implementation, it's hugely important because we're expecting it to be difficult to find a lot of these people. And if you think about what's happening in the jail, you have this point of time where you can really intervene and change someone's trajectory. I just wanted to preview for you and, and others that to do that work, what the ELP, the way it's structured, we can't actually see the charge. We can only see, see whether they were in the jail or not. Um, and it's also slightly difficult to, to calculate length of stay. So what we would love to do actually is hand the risk list back over to the agency that has the authority to look at that more detailed information and then analyze it statistically. Because then I think we can start to answer exactly those kinds of questions. It just requires a little bit of a dance through the CIO's office. But you know, we'd love to be a part of that. And just to add a note, to one thing we're doing is we're going agency by agency to understand their population better. So take the jail population and look at their service histories to understand, say, if you, if you were to you know, have them in front of you, who are these people? You know, who, which agencies would they have touched? What intervention could you design? And that way, you also break down the problem of understanding who these individuals are into a more manageable subsets. Right? And the jail is a great place to start. Um, data scientists with LA Care. I know that you guys have uh, deindividuated the list, but you've also linked it across agencies. Was that work done by you or by the CIO? And the reason I ask is, if it was done by you, there's a greater opportunity to link to other information about individuals through an organization like mine. Yeah, so that, that's actually, um, I'm so glad you brought that up. We are relying on the legal infrastructure that the county wrote to create the enterprise linkage project data, which allows the county to link files, right? And so we, are, we can only do what the county would have had the authority to do. Um, when we talk about the enterprise linkage project data, it's really about 400 flat files sitting on county services that are, or county servers that are sort of reported in at various times. It's not what we would call a true integrated database that has a live 24-hour refreshing feed, which hopefully will be there by the end of the year. So when we created the, the integrated data system on our server, we had to map our ability to link to the underlying legal infrastructure of the county. Um, and then we were starting to able to, to get sort of individualized permissions. So for example, we use our own copy of the HMIS because um, we'd done some data cleaning on it in advance. So we would love to do that. And, and as many of you know, we really see our data infrastructure uh, to grow as a public good for research. So while people can go to the county and get the same data, it's very time consuming. It's very difficult. You know, so we're trying to work on ways to get more people access directly to our uh, data set. Um, but we'd love to talk to you about. And just to clarify, this would always be you know, the county owns the data. Yeah. Right, but right now, if anybody is approved to use the data, they probably spend many, many months, you know, linking it and cleaning it. Right, and so the idea is to help, you know, as a as a service, help lower the barriers to entry to do this work once. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Uh, Becky Newman with the Rose Hills Foundation, is will there be a way to link when you start looking at DCFS and how it works, link that to a prior history with GR or other systems? Like if somebody was on GR and then had kids and then was on CalWORKs or, and then had interaction with DCFS. Like sort of the link between, or the move between single individuals to homeless families. Yes. <laughs> In the sense that, that, that those data sets all live in different parts of different agencies. So it, you know, we're, we're in the process of linking those. But the end product would then be you know, a sequence of service histories on the core programs, including CalWORKs, GR, DCFS, CalFresh, yeah. Kishani, Housing Authority, County of Los Angeles. Um, so thank you very much again for um, what you're doing because the prevention piece is such a critical piece of the puzzle of homelessness. Um, at the county, at the Housing Authority, we just got um, done yesterday actually a rapid uh, innovation lab focusing on workforce development and self-sufficiency specific to our public housing residents. So we are focused on a pool of people and who we have access to. So are you envisioning this maybe further upstream in your work? Uh, or maybe it's not part of your work, but how do you envision getting access to the people in these various public agencies revolving around confidential issues? How do you how do you help the folks once you identify them? Because we, we kind of can ring fence 
our public housing votes then. So narrow the scope even further to one site, which is what we're doing in terms of bringing them to self-sufficiency. So just curious if you have thought about that at all. Thanks. Um, I think our, our feeling is that we're actually not the best people to really think about that problem. I think we, we're working in partnership with different agencies and would like to add more to really think about, with the experts on these people, what they might need. Um, and so it might look different if it's in the jail um, or in the emergency room, which seems maybe a little less likely just due to feasibility. or. Um, you know, are working with LASA to understand the intersection between this work and how they're currently targeting prevention with the prevention targeting tool. So we haven't had the opportunity to really talk to the housing authorities about their clients, and housing authority data is not linked in yet to this, uh, to this integrated data set, which we'd love to do, but um, would be happy to talk to you. It's, it's our experience that um, we're like the worst people <laughs> generating these ideas. I think matching sort of the insights we're gathering with the real subject matter expertise on the ground is really where, as Gary would say, you start to get to social innovation. Uh, Janie's very humble. I mean, of course, we try to be very active thought partners. And one thing we're doing now with the agencies that are represented in the EOP to have a conversation of, well, now that you have the risk list, how would you implement it? And once you've isolated the people, what programs you know, could you bring to bear and also you know, evaluate to see which ones are most effective, right? And we are sort of partners along the entire way, right? And what Janie's trying to say that, you know, we don't come with a set of prefabricated ideas. It's a conversation that we're seeking to understand how to best help those folks. Sarah Hunter from The Rain Corporation. Terrific presentation, really complex analysis and, and putting it into a space that we could all understand. Um, as we learned earlier from um, Corinne Buchanan's presentation a couple months ago, Housing for Health, I think, has placed 3,500 people. ODR has now placed over 1,000 people. So there are interventions already underway um, that have targeted the vulnerable populations and placed them in housing. And I was just curious if you were able to, or you thought about incorporating <coughs> that information in some way and how that impacted your analyses. Um, so I think there might be at least two questions in there, sort of are we thinking about the Housing for Health set of resources and can we integrate the data maybe on those clients into the, um, but I might be slightly misstating. Well, could that be one of your 900 risk factors? Is that yeah, they received sure. housing for health? Like, is that actually one of the 900 or something? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't sure if you were able to include people who got housing interventions, so people who had been identified during that window of time, that five years, um, as being homeless and then got a housing intervention. And I don't know, they then, in fact, were not in the HMIS data, because I think you used shelter days. Yeah, right. Um, so, uh, how did you, so it sounds like you might not have been able to incorporate that. So I encourage you to reach out to DHS and um, to ODR and maybe get that information and include it in your model because I think it'll help with precision. Right? Yeah, so we. They're targeting kind of the most vulnerable and yeah. housing. So let me just, just answer that, sorry, till um, that specific question. So we, we do have the DHS data and the DHS homeless flag, um, and I think it's the CHAMP system that uh, is related to housing for health. We can't fully incorporate it into the model because um, the way that we built the model, we needed five years of service history. And so that using that flag as an outcome definition was problematic because it's such a recent program. It didn't go back far enough. Um, but we are just sort of generally thinking about these administrative flags for homelessness and how we can improve the precision of the model. And, and as I said before, it's hugely important for agencies to collect that information accurately so that it can be used in these sort of broader statistical analyses. We're also working with Corinne and her team to think about prevention. So um, I thought at first your question was sort of, are, are housing for health resources maybe appropriate for this population? And I, I think you have to be literally homeless to qualify um, for most of them. And so we're sort of thinking strategically about what might be a prevention type resource. Um, there's critical time intervention, which has been tried in LA County, which is uh, evidence-based for, for that population. And there's also sort of pockets of funding, for example, rapid rehousing slots at probation that could be leveraged or um, connecting with the whole person care teams and some of their outreach strategies. So we're trying to map out what would be an appropriate intervention for someone who isn't literally homeless, but who's very high risk. 
Hi, um, Meredith Berkson with the uh, County Homeless Initiative. I just wanted to ask um, what data, hello, Hi. Um, what data um, would be most meaningful to have? Like what available data that you don't have currently would be most meaningful to have um, to help move this work forward? How, many, how much time do you have? Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just to <laughs> do you want to go? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think we're obviously, from our list, very focused on capturing more data from DPSS. Um, that, and, and that's been offered. It's just a more challenging timeline for a variety of reasons I won't go into. But that's the CalFresh and CalWORKs data. DCFS, everyone knows that that intersection between DCFS and homelessness is hugely important. And so it feels like a, a big piece of insight that's missing. Even if we're focused on single adults, I think a lot of times people talk about that in the context of family homelessness, but potentially very important for single adult homelessness as well. Um, generally speaking, for studying homelessness in LA County, we have to start linking in the housing authority data, at least to the HMIS. Um, it is critically important, and I, I say this in lots of meetings, so I apologize for those of you who have heard me say it before, but um, understanding that housing resource and what's happening as an additional outcome to the HMIS data, I think would open up a lot of insights and, and potential fixes and solutions that, that we don't see now. So what would you add to that? Well, just one more piece. Um, so we've been, as Janie mentioned, we've merged the HMIS data with uh, earnings records from the state. And one thing that comes out of that analysis <clears throat> is that there's a group of people who have never had covered employment. And then there's a group of people who had, and that group remains employed with a relatively high rate throughout episodes of homelessness. Meaning there is sort of an employment angle here that really matters that is almost completely absent from the ELP, right? And there, there are sort of one-off merges or merges of CalWORKs data with earnings records, right? Um, so I think the process mer of trying to merge some of the uh, CalJobs data from WEDAX to uh, the HMIS is, is a good idea, but that's going to be sort of still, you know, part of the iceberg, right? Because so many people don't really get WEDAX services necessarily, right? So at some point, you want to think of a way of just taking the ELP to Sacramento and merge it to EDD and cut the Gordic dot to, to try to assess that, yeah. And we spent a HPRI meeting talking about all of the potential questions we could actually answer if we had these kinds of linkages. So anybody that ever wants to ask what data do you want, we can give you the list at a drop of an email. So we appreciate <laughs> everyone who can help us. Now you have our prioritization for the predictive <laughs> project. And you have some email addresses right there if you don't see them in front of you. Yes, in the back. Uh, Miguel Fernandez with Lhasa. I have a question. How did you account for uh, structural changes during that time period between the 2012 and 2016 that resulted that have resulted in changes in 2017. So structural changes in our system um, that weren't accounted for in the, that time period that you were looking back at. Uh, well, there's, there's various types of changes. You know, you know there's policy changes, yes. and as well as data changes. And so, the answer is we spent a lot of time, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, talking to Lhasa and you know bugging LASA, chasing after LASA to understand, especially the HMIS. So that's a huge uh, thing we've, we've thought about, especially about the transition between the two HMIS systems. And what, and one last question. Um, what role did income play in predicting? Did you, uh, were you able to tease that out in terms of? So I'm glad you bring that up again, just to make a second point. So you know, HMIS has a bit of income information. Most of the other data sources don't. So income can't be really included. In, in the broad paths, right, it can be included if we sort of predict LASA specific outcomes, right? And I do think other than the housing uh, information, right, having income information will be extremely helpful for, for helping to prevent homelessness. Andrew? Um, Andrew Lumine with the Conrad and Holman Foundation. Um, it's Jamie, when you're talking about uh, the resources available and matching the predictive, the predictive outcomes to specific resources, I know that there's a national conversation sort of brewing about the idea of pushing the federal government to reconsider how we can use some resources because we're getting better at this. So this idea that chron the idea of chronic homelessness is not necessarily as relevant today as it was when it emerged. Um, and that now that we've got these clearer definitions and a better understanding of the populations we're trying to serve and putting this emphasis on catching individuals of high acuity is really the, the word that's sort of emerging. But I'm just curious if you guys 
have begun to have those conversations because I feel like these data could be really valuable and these outputs would be really valuable to the federal conversation. And um, I know that sometimes it feels like a big policy push, but um, we've actually here in LA influenced some policy decisions at the federal level over the last 10 years, and so it's not unheard of. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it'd just be good for us to get become part of the conversation. I'm just curious if you've done that at all yet or if that's... So it's a very good question. Actually, I'd love to talk a bit more how you see the, the federal piece of this because the, the data is you know, obviously suited to predict you know, homelessness, but at the same time, you know, that second part of the presentation was really thinking through you know, what are the pathways, right? And you, know, you could predict homelessness or you could predict different levels of acuity and understand right, what are sort of different tiers of folks, right? So the same thing, the same way you could you know, think about chronic homelessness as just a repetition of this sort of a homelessness flag. You could think of you know, DMH service histories or other ways of classifying the homeless, right? And so that's something we're working on just to understand what population we're dealing with. And we hope that the more nuanced view arises. Right? There's work done in Allegheny County to sort of use predictive modeling to understand acuity, right? And we're working on that as well. And Andrea, I'd love to hear more about sort of what federal sources you think might be influenceable. The only concrete idea that we've started to work on very superficially is this idea that if you can prevent homelessness within a system where you can observe health outcomes and you can show that the prevention strategy is reducing costs for the health system, um, it could start to build evidence or support for things like Medicaid waivers or sort of changes in how we think about how the health system funding is spent. Um, we thought about partnering, you know, with a big sort of health agency, like just for example, Kaiser, you know, to try to do that. I don't know that we would have Kaiser, Kaiser clients here. It's, a, it's just an, an open question because our hospital data is from the county. But who, whoever it is, if someone were willing to do a really rigorous experiment, and show the causal impact of homeless prevention, not just on housing stability, but on cost savings in the health system, then I think we could really you know, start to push that conversation forward in a meaningful way. Because I, I don't think they're going to invest in homeless prevention until you make the case financially that it's beneficial. So, I, I know the National said homelessness is looking at so, you know, which way they might want to push, help push the conversation. So. Yeah, that'd be great. It's super exciting. Up here we go. Continue to have many hands, so we'll tell you through all of them. Hi, Ed Moreno with the City of Los Angeles Controller's Office. I have a question. Does it, your model use any data utilization patterns from the City of Los Angeles, such as LAPD or LA Fire Department? No, not right now. Yeah, we do have a research partnership with the City of LA and with LAPD, but we can't link that data in. Um. Ecosol with CSH. Um, just piggybacking off the conversation just before the, the, the last question. I think that um, this is sort of from the room, really. The CIPRA NOFA that came out from the federal government might be a very interesting application um, for the social impact um, NOFA. I think there's, the, the NOFA is really confusing, as all, all federal government NOFAs are. Um, but the, the, the way to calculate cost and, and make those savings for the federal, particularly the federal um, lines of funding, is sort of the core of that NOFA. And I think this work combined with that like ready funding to do some of the cost savings would be a really interesting opportunity for everyone. So check out the Super Nova. Just the Super Nova. <laughs> Super Nova. Yeah. I'm curious if um, if you as you look forward, is there a possibility to look at resiliency oriented data um, in terms of what factors when you consider your predictive model, like the people who don't fit that model, not because your algorithm is wrong per se, but because of they have some other resiliency factor. I think that could also be the segue to intervention work, right, possibly. So I'm curious how you're considering uh, resiliency factors. Really cool. False negatives. Yeah, or false positives, yeah. I guess. There's various answers to this. I think one thing that's happening at the very end is that we're looking at you know, opening the black box and seeing the different pathways, say, interactions, right? So there's a group of people in the jail, right, who may have, you know, mental health, a history of mental health services. And then, you know, you could see the different, you know, diagnosis codes and see who then is most at risk among these, right? Um, this becomes 
a bit more powerful if you have an intervention where you can see who, who, what's the difference in the causal effects of these interventions. Right? So if you had, say, an intervention on prevention, right, some will really benefit and some for some reason don't. And the data science can help you pinpoint those factors uh, reasonably accurately. Right? And so that's, I think, a great way forward. Uh, two totally unrelated questions. Um, first one is, um, you talked a little bit about the data quality earlier. Um, to what degree were defin definitional differences, like even definition of homelessness, uh, you know, a barrier? And are, do you have any recommendations for um, kind of more consistency across all the different data sources in terms of definitions and kind of ways that we identify and define certain kind of milestones and touch points? So that's one. Uh, two, um, to what degree did demographics kind of play a role in any of the analyses that you guys were doing, at least at this stage? Um, just because I'm wondering if there's any kind of critical intersection between kind of the findings from the previous ad hoc committee's report and the things that we're looking at now in terms of like what is kind of driving people into homelessness. Um, so o overall, we demographic features that we can observe in the data are important, and those are primarily age and sex. The ELP data does not have a lot of demographic information in it, and it, in fact, it does not have race um, consistently. So that, that's actually something we're thinking about internally. On the one hand, there's no way we could claim the model is sort of biasing a group. On the other hand, we can't go back and detect the bias, right? So it, it's, it's um, a, cha a challenge for us that's maybe unique to LA compared to some other systems that definitely include race as a variable. Um, the HMIS does have race, as you know, but, it, but we don't have it for the other data sets. Um, I think on the, uh, the question of, of data quality, um, do you have a few hours? <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think to, to simplify it, my observation is that because the Enterprise Linkage Project data, which was this completely revolutionary tool. It was really first of its kind. It's about 10 to 12 years old. There was a massive amount of work done at the county to create the political will to do this and to get each of these agencies to agree to feed into it. I don't think, though, that it's been used frequently by the research community. And that's important because the research community thinks about data to do statistical analysis and looks at rates of missingness, or is there a common definition across different agencies, or some of these things that may not be as important to an agency looking at its own data to do performance management type tasks. So I think with the ELP modernization, what's going to happen naturally is that this group of consumers who are using the data either for individual case level planning or for these broader statistical analyses will start to have create a, a feedback loop where we can sort of prioritize uh, data quality tasks, and, and I think I'm personally, given my background, very sensitive to the idea that the system can't absorb 100 changes to the way it collects information. It's just not feasible. So part of it is prioritizing what really matters um, and, and figuring out um, how to get it done. I, I do think that having consistency around how we're documenting homelessness by agencies that are not primarily tasked with dealing with homelessness is really important, and that's come up a few times today. Um, and there are lots of uh, quality issues with the HMIS that I think are completely frustrating to LASA. It's not like they're unaware of them. Um, and we hope to be thought partners in sort of how to fix some of those issues, too. It's just very hard when you have a system that's being fed in from hundreds of service organizations, social workers working really hard. They're trying to serve their client. The last thing on their mind is thinking about some you know, egghead researcher at UCLA is going to come two years later and say, like, did this person get housed in rapid rehousing? You know, it's just not. So there's, uh, we're sympathetic to that, but I think there may be some uh, higher priority fixes there as well. Let me just add, because this came, didn't come up earlier. So we are working, or, or, and, and, you know, we need to, the, the county's help to, to get, in, try to get state level data onto the data that would have information on race, right? The mortality data and, and birth records our chief of the two, right? Oh, I live in shelter partnership. And I was just wondering about the first time a homeless grouping, um, and that within the group there would be people who have a service history with the county and those that don't. Um, and if you touched on um, what percentage of that population had a service history and which didn't, and then for those, because it seemed like a lot of the risk factors had to do with service history, so, um, 
is there much hope of being able to predict people who are homeless for the first time who don't have that service history? Do you think we'll be able to find risk factors for that group? Um, and I have another question, but I, I can't recall it now. Let me just answer this one because it's relatively straightforward. So this data, as, as it stands, is all about service histories. I say we, we talked about other information such as adding race or adding income or adding housing information. But right now it's service history. So if you don't have a service history, there's just a blank. So we can't predict your risk of homelessness, right? But some of the opportunities we talked about here is to reducing that size of the group, that, that group and get more information. Yeah, and for, for first time homelessness, the portion of people who experience homelessness for the first time who have a service history that we can observe is about 37%. Uh, we think that number will grow when we add DCFS and some of the DPSS data like CalFresh and, and CalWORKS, but um, there, there's a large portion of people who just appear because they're homeless and no one's ever seen them before. Um, and we don't know a lot about who they are. Um, and that's why I mentioned, I think, that's important to understand the limitations of this type of data science, but it's also really important to think about how you're serving those people, because it's very possible they would be eligible for, for other services. I remember my other question was that how much of, do you think you'll be able to suss out how much of a risk factor previous episodes of homelessness are in terms of becoming homeless again? So like, is that, are those people the ones who are the most at risk for becoming homeless? So maybe as a a policy decision we focus on resources on people who have previous episodes of homelessness. That's a very good point. And uh, we, can, we, have, we have those sort of histories from the GR and HMIS flag. And, you know, in an extreme way, if, if you're chronically homeless, those are, that's usually predictive, right? If you have been out for six months, right, the predictive power of these past homeless melts goes down, but it's still present, right? And so that's exactly why we took that approach to split off the first time homeless from those who are, you know, ep who have episodic homelessness to some degree, because we thought they, they might be different, they might have different service needs, right? And we have more information to predict on. And Brian, was prior HMIS service or prior GR homeless flag a top 20 feature for the NHS model? Do you uh, remember? Yes. It is, yeah. Um, I mean, this is all very tentative, but it, it does look like uh, the prior homeless spells and, and the recency and, and the length of those previous homeless spells are. Let, let, let me just add something to this. You know, there's one way to do this and just you know run the model and see what pops out. And we, we always complement any analysis of features with a descriptive analysis. For example, we have taken the GR flag and have taken a careful look of repetitive patterns of homelessness. Right? So any predictive factor has in itself a data pattern, like that spiked figure you just saw. Right? And so it's never just something that only comes out of a, of a statistical tool. It's always combined with sort of going back to understanding what the patterns and the data are, especially on repeated homelessness spells. Hi, Barbara Stillman, City of Los Angeles Controller's Office. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about county services uh, being provided. The city also has uh, homeless initiatives with affordable housing. Are you looking at pulling in any affordable housing, real estate, income into the model. The short answer will be yes, please. Thanks, Gary. So, I mean, I, I'm going to take this a step back. Um, at, when, when we started about two years ago, one of the first conversations we had was with the city, with the mayor's office, on seeing whether we could predict homelessness of families coming through the city's family source centers. Right. And so, yes, we are aware of the city's, you know, efforts uh, and have been in conversation with the city. And then it more boils down to, you know, is this, is this feasible from a data sharing point of view? And, you know, that, that, that effort has been lingering for about two years. Uh, but we are very actively talking to the chief legislative analyst office on some of these issues. Right? And if you have other ideas or think there's other data that you can harness, but the fam the, the, they were several data sets that were just deemed to be very hard to access. We can have a separate conversation, but we'd love to have that, yeah. Hi, Hannah Kelly with Senator Bob Hertzberg's office. I was wondering, as you're looking at uh, causes and risk factors uh, for, for homelessness in the county and city level, I was wondering if you're also looking at assessing any policies at either the local or state level that can be either re-examined or uh, potential <coughs> policy changes as well. 
that's a big question. So, yeah. where you could, you know, Janie had this this slide up where we think of different types of prevention. So, you know, and we're mostly focused here on specific programs affecting individuals on the ground and seeing, you know, how could those be, which ones are effective and how could they be effectively targeted, right? There are important conversations upstream on, say, housing policies or income policies that matter, which we're interested in, which are not as closely integrated in this part of the project, right? But if you have specific questions uh, around a range of policies, we'd be happy to. I mean, it, 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 there are sort of an, an important set of upstream questions that go beyond the specific data science that we're happy to be thought partners on. I would, just, I would just add to this, and it's not at all inconsistent with what Till is saying, but it's very hard for us to understand the nuances of those conversations as they're happening either at the county or at level or in Sacramento. And so um, it's really helpful for us to know what people are trying to achieve because then we can sort of brainstorm whether anything we're doing sheds light on an issue that you're trying to solve or could support a position. We don't do ag advocacy ourselves, but we're more than happy to provide information to advocates if it's useful. Um, and this is why we love working in collaboration because it's just very hard for us to stay on top of that because it's a pretty complex, fast moving world. <laughs> I just want to throw out there on the, on the state side, and Jessica's sitting at your table right there, there are some huge opportunities to reorient money in the criminal justice system that's currently being used to pay for less effective, sometimes completely ineffective, interventions like transitional housing that don't necessarily always work. And there's a lot of state money, a lot, a lot of state money, Jessica can tell you all about it, um, that could be reoriented, that could go to pay for these sorts of programs. And the restrictions on those funds are not the same as the restrictions that come from Hyde, right? It's more flexible like the money that's like the healthcare dollars. And so I think the healthcare and criminal justice are two of the biggest spaces and you saw from the data. There's huge, huge opportunity there to decrease the incarcerated population if we can help those individuals get into some of these housing, more effective housing interventions. That, yes, that one. <laughs> that, that one, that one, put that on the list. So I was just gonna ask if you had any, uh, th there were questions that weren't asked but you'd love to have commented on or just one final comment as we conclude our conversation today. Um, I was actually, it just occurred to me as we were talking that I was remiss in not thinking a number of people here from LASA who did a lot of work in helping us understand the HMIS data in particular. So Aaron Cox, um, Ian in his former role, um, uh, people who are not here, Steve Rocha and Pata and Stephanie and um, a whole cast of characters that we bothered frequently. So I just wanted to say thank you to everyone there uh, for your support and also to Max Stevens in the CIO's office. No, this is exactly the type of conversation we seek. This was all very helpful and uh, I look forward to continuing this collaboration. Well, as Till said, uh, you know, Janie is a brilliant presenter and, and, and <laughs> explains very complicated things very well. Um, we're very happy to have her. We're ha we have CPL, the full team that's here, um, just as partners as we work together to achieve the goal of ending chronic homelessness. So thank you so much for your work and partnership. Thank you. Gary. Yeah.